Good morning. Today is Thursday, June 20th, 2019, and we are at Cleveland Public Library, the People's University, the main branch in downtown Cleveland. My name is Regina Williams, and our narrator for this segment of the Oral History Project is Miss Jasmine Elder. Thank you so much for saying yes and agreeing to meet with us today. I um, would like to remind our viewers and listeners that the series of oral history interviews that we are working on is related to a chapter for a book for our colleagues in South Africa. Uh, the title, the working title of the chapter, Race, Religion, and Reconciliation, Academic Initiatives, Leadership, Development, and Social Change. So again, thank you no for being part of this project and all the other great projects that were related to your work at Cleveland State. Our videographer today is Ms. Catherine Young. And I would just like to get started, Ms. Elder, by asking that you please state your full name mm -hmm. and your institutional affiliation. Um, my name is Jasmine Elder, and I am a two-time alumna of Cleveland State University. OK. And are you working with Cleveland State now? I do not work at Cleveland State now. OK. And are, where are you working? In the so system? I work with Frontline Services, which is a mental health agency. So I help our homeless get employed. I'm an employment specialist. So I help with that uh, population. OK, wonderful. And how long have you worked at Frontline or in this field where you're reaching out to the homeless? Um, I've been at Frontline for maybe a year and maybe a year and a half. I started there in February uh, 2018 as an employment specialist. Um, but prior to that, I was a residential counselor at Boys Hope, Girls Hope, which is um, it caters to like our um, inner city children and we kind of help them navigate through just the struggles and access to education things of that nature so i did that before then then before that i was at cleveland state for about seven years and every year that i was at cleveland state i probably held like 10 jobs <laughs> okay well i, I lot there. <laughs> yes well i heard you say earlier most importantly that you're a two-time alumna so you yes. weren't just marking time you were earning degrees Right. So can you tell us about the degrees that you earned at Cleveland State University? Right. So in 2010, I started at Cleveland State where I pursued my bachelor's in psychology. Two years later, I picked up um, another bachelor's in sociology, so I double majored during my undergrad. Um, and I minored in women's studies at that time, graduated in 2014 with both bachelor's and then a minor in women's studies, and I went right back. Um, really took maybe a couple of months off, went right back that summer in 2015, and graduated in 2017 with my master's in adult learning and development. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of more so the higher ed track. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned you had about seven jobs I did. <laughs> while I did. you were earning these degrees. <laughs> Tell me about juggling all those responsibilities and some of the activities or offices where you worked oh, on yeah. campus. So when I first started, I was in the communications building. I was an office assistant. Um, to the, she was like the administrator of mm -hmm. communication. So I did that for a little bit. At the same time, I then picked up American Reads, which was a tutoring program where our career services department mm -hmm. um, linked with the Cleveland Public Libraries in Cuyahoga County. And we did tutoring like in that, in that evening with kids from K through six and all subjects. So I did that for maybe two years. Then I ended up somehow in commuter affairs. Um, I was a uh, student ambassador for Commuter Affairs. It was the first time we had just got a director of Commuter Affairs, the first time that Cleveland State really started to cater to that commuter um, population. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of helping with that, kind of pilot, uh, help pilot that um, startup. So I was an office assistant there, and then I doubled as an office assistant, uh, assistant in the student affairs um, department. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, I did Camp Bike, which it was a startup for first generation of students um, to kind of get acclimated. It was a three day camp to get acclimated to the campus prior to them starting. Um, eventually it expanded to all incoming freshmen mm -hmm. where I served as a senior camp counselor where I helped train the camp counselors under me, things of that nature. And then when I graduated, I became a GA. Um, in the Department of Student Affairs at, in Leadership and Service, and then that title changed to Fraternity and Sorority Life. So I did that until I graduated. Hmm. 
That's about seven. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like he Every had year. a full life <laughs> yeah, as a student. Um, I want to ask also, and this isn't exactly one of the questions on uh, the protocol, but since the chapter focuses on race, religion, and reconciliation, um, can you tell me, please, if you don't mind sharing, are you affiliated with a church in Northeast Ohio? I am. So I attend St. Timothy Missionary Baptist Church, mm -hmm. 7101 Carnegie Avenue. So I've been there all my life, probably. <laughs> and are any of your employment activities related to the work of that church? Uh, not employment, but we do a lot of, so I'm a part of ministries, like our young adult ministry. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of different type of outreaches. Like our mission is really just being out in the community because mm -hmm. um, community matters. It's just kind of meeting people where they're at. We do back to school events. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's my ministry is from ages 18 to 45. And what we do is we host like Easter egg hunts for kids or different things like that. We have different outings for like my generation. Um, of people so I'm very in that I'm in the choir so we do have like a young adult choir and then I assist with our our older our older generation of um, adults um, with dancing so I'm part of a dancing and grace ministry so I help you know choreograph and help with that so as the chaplain so I do a lot of the praying and stuff over that ministry mm -hmm. And um, would you say, I know Cleveland is a majority black city, mm -hmm. but um, would you characterize your congregation as a, a black church? Yes. Okay, yes. And, and why so? How would you define uh, a black church? <laughs> Everyone looks like me. We, <laughs> we might have had maybe a couple of sprinkles here or there. Um, and when I say sprinkle, meaning we might have had a couple of Caucasians maybe come to the church, but majority of my congregation, not 100% of it is uh, back. Mm -hmm. so. And how large is the congregation, if I may ask? Um, I think we're at like 300 maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, it differs every Sunday, you know, if you got your favorite Sunday. So it just depends. And then, so like I think overall we might have about 300 members that's like on the roster um, at minimum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like you're, you're very involved in the church activities. Uh, are you a lifer? Is, has your family been there for a while? So my mom didn't really go to the church. She'd come on like certain days, like youth day and stuff like that. But I've been there all my life because my grandmother um, actually raised me. So your grandparents always put you in the church and that's kind of how it started. Started off as a junior usher, had to get in the kids choir, um, candy stripings. I was like a mini nurse at one point until I grew up the dress. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so since I was little, I definitely was pretty active in the church. Okay, thank you for sharing it. No Can you tell me a little bit more about your early life? What are your parents' names, and when and where were you born? So, my mother's name is Amy Faye Elder, not too familiar with the um, parental side of that, but um, I grew up here in Cleveland, Ohio, born, still here, so born and raised here. Um, my grandmother was um, Iona Elder, so she also raised me. That's why a lot of my time, my y younger days was spent with my grandmother, like I left with her. Um, and my mother was very so in Cleveland, so, so they like pretty much shared custody of me, my twin sister, so I have a twin sister, we're two minutes apart, um, and my older brother. So we, we grew up here in Cleveland. I had some close nearby cousins. So my mother had a younger brother here who also had about seven kids. So we lived like right around the corner from each other. So we did a lot of this plan and um, that kind of stuff. Um, I went to I went to quite a few schools, but at, I went to Roosevelt Elementary, Cranwood Elementary. Then I went to um, Citizens Academy from fourth through sixth grade. And then I transferred to Hope Academy Broadway for my middle school, 6th to 8th grade, well, 7th to 8th, and then Hope High for 9th and 10th. The school was shut down, and I, I graduated at Horizon Science Academy and completed my 11th and 12th grade year there. Okay. Cleveland born and bred yes. and educated. Yes. Okay. Um, at this point in time, with all of your educational experiences in the public and charter schools, it mm -hmm. sounds like, of the city yeah. of Cleveland, and then uh, a public college at Cleveland State mm -hmm. University. Um, two degrees there and two or three majors at the undergrad level. Mm -hmm. What would you say now is your primary field of expertise? 
I would have to go with leadership. I think from psychology to get to sociology to getting to know people and how they run organizational leadership that I learned in my master's program and a lot of just my work in my grad program as well as in my current work that I do, I think leadership pretty much is my overarching like expertise. Like, um, I mean, it took time for me to realize that, like that natural born leader um, within me, but I would say leadership um, and education, like I'm like, I'm like a go when it comes to education. I care so much about it. Um, I encourage people to really be about it. Um, so those two, mm-hmm. which would make sense, I guess. And you know, with that being your primary area of expertise, um, how do you see that matching up with your work on behalf of the homeless? So. So my population, I work with individuals who obviously experienced some type of rough time, some type of trauma in their life, and it, it ended up they're homeless. And so what we do is we put them in permanent housing. And as an employment specialist, I help them find jobs. So a lot of the times they realize that, oh, I don't have a high school diploma. Oh, I don't know this skill, technical skills. I don't know how to read. I don't know how to write. So then um, why it's not strictly written in to my responsibilities, duties, and roles, I'm a very strong advocate about, oh, well, let's go back to school. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's going to play a very big role um, in the workforce. And that may not be always true, but that helps them feel better about themselves. Mm-hmm. So I'm always promoting education, although it's not really generally my role. It's very client-driven. I mm-hmm. work in a very client-driven field, so what they want is what I do. Um, if they just want a job, you know, flipping burgers, or they want a job um, as a, you know, doing garbage or whatever the case may be, I help them find that. I talk to employers and stuff like that. But I try to like slot the educational piece in there because you see that a lot of people somewhere in their time of finding themselves homeless may not have completed school, may have like a third grade education level and things of like that. So they are not up to par with where we at today. And the workforce is trying, is so far ahead of them that they can't understand what that realm looks like. And mm-hmm. part of understanding a realm that's forever changing is the educational piece. So I kind of try to encourage that as much as possible. And I've had plenty of clients go back to school just because I like threw a little bug in their ear or something like that. So mm-hmm. I feel like I'm the educational specialist and like, although my title is employment specialist, like my supervisor understands that I care a lot about that part too. Uh-huh. So. Okay, thank you. Now, um, you described, uh, sounds like a really large and vibrant, engaged, extended family. Mm-hmm. I think you said your mother has a brother, the brother has about seven children, all mm-hmm. of the cousins are mm-hmm. living, you know, in close proximity. Mm-hmm. And then your grandmother certainly is engaged in church activities. And you have a twin sister. Yeah. So do you know what really attracted your grandmother to this part of the country? Or is she a native Clevelander too? Uh, no, my grandmother is from Alabama. Um, I can't think of where originally, but that is my, technically my mother's father's second wife. So I did not know my mother's um, maternal grandmother. I never got to meet her. She passed away before I was born. So the, my grandfather remarried, and that is who raised us. So when she raised us, she was already here in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not really sure why she came here or anything like that. I mean, she talk about her time in Alabama. Even at our church, we have what they call Alabama State Club. So you kind of learn a lot of that history and what it was like down south for them. Um, but I'm not, I don't know exactly why what mm-hmm. attracted her there. My mom is originally from Texas, and her grandfather lived, was here at some point, so her and my older brother had moved here, and then she had me and my sister, so that's what attracted was every summer my mom would come back and forth to be with her father, so okay. that's how my mom got here, and now my sister and my mother lives in Texas, mm-hmm. so I'm here, and my brother joined the Marines at one point, so okay. he's in Albuquerque. All right. Well, so again, um, a greatly extended family here now in Northeast Ohio, but still with ties to the American South. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sounds like a familiar great migration story for African American people. Yeah. yeah. Do you hear a lot of stories about going home as far as going back to Alabama to reconnect with other relatives in the South? Well, I mean, yeah. So my grandmother is a, has passed away, unfortunately, in 2004. 2004. So, but during that time, she would talk a lot about her family, 
down south and what it was like growing up there. But she did spend a good majority up here mm -hmm. too as well. So. Yeah. Have you ever heard our hometown referred to as Alabama North? I haven't, no. Oh, I have to tell you some of those stories <laughs> after the interview. But thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we're, I think, making good progress in okay. getting through the list. So thank you for your responses. But can you tell me a little bit more about your experiences as an undergraduate student at Cleveland State, uh, especially as it relates to racial and cultural diversity? because that's the type of program that brought us together mm -hmm. in 2012. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. I mean, when I first got to Cleveland State, I really, I really wasn't really trying to go there. That wasn't, so there was a lady at my church um, named Sister Archer, and she was just like, you know, I got accepted to a whole bunch of other colleges, but besides that, got there, it's pretty interesting to join TRIO first, mm -hmm. um, which is for first generational students to kind of get them, help them acclimate tutors, rather um, give them advisors. So just kind of help them on the straight and narrow. So that was pretty helpful. And TRIO was connected to a program called AHANA, um, which stood for African, Hispanic, Asian, Native American. So that was where you really start to see, well, I start to see a lot of just different types of cultures come together. I think like my first real exposure to just, I mean, I grew up in an all black community. You rarely would see anybody that did not look like me. Um, I did go to a high school though. There was individuals from like Turkey and stuff like my teachers was Turkish and mm -hmm. things of that nature. So I did see that part, I took Turkish. Um, but when I got to college, other races started to play a role, ethnicity, backgrounds, different cultures, um, and to pay attention. So I participated in an international day. And mm -hmm. that's just where like that big expansion of who's all here on this campus really made sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, because I think at that point, it's just what you look like. Are you white, you black? Like that's where my mindset was until mm -hmm. we kind of start to learn just because your skin is this color doesn't necessarily mean you identify this way. Mm -hmm. So um, it was interesting. And then I joined a sorority, which is not typically a D9 sorority. It's not a D9 sorority. In and D9, is that Divine 9? Divine 9. Mm -hmm. okay. So it wasn't a Divine 9 uh, sorority. And it was predominantly white. So majority, if not all, but at the time my sorority was actually um, diverse. So I had individuals, we had individuals, we were known for the most diversity on campus, as a matter of fact. So we had individuals from Honduras, um, Tokyo, Asia, different things like that, so. Okay, and what sorority is that for? That's by you now. Um, at that time we were a local sorority, it was called Gamma Delta when I first joined, and then we went national okay. um, in my term. By 2014, okay. we had one national. So your engagement with diverse students, uh, members of the undergraduate student body at Cleveland State, primarily through the TRIO program and uh -huh. also your sorority. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And how did, when and how, did you first become aware of the major social and economic challenges that people of color, especially black Americans um, and Indian people, and racially mixed people were facing in apartheid and post-apartheid eras in South Africa's history. I would like to say that I learned that in a history book somewhere in my term in school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not true. It literally was in 2012 when I went to South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, learning about talking one-on-one -on -one to those students there, um, getting a tour throughout the city um, in the country was when we really start to uh, they experienced like slavery this closely, this close to home. Like it was that first time I ever like maybe walked in the area mm -hmm. and just kind of felt like the trauma and stuff that those that you know I can call sisters and my brothers and stuff like that um, experience. Okay. Well, tell me about your introduction to that program. If it was so eye-opening, how did you find out about it, and mm -hmm. and why did you choose to go to South Africa? Uh, I, I, was a, I was selected to be a mentor. So when we did like a exchange program, um, so that we had individuals from Bloemfontein, the University of Free State from Bloemfontein, South Africa come. And so I helped mentor those. And we had like six kids on our campus at the time. Um, and just helped them get acclimated and kind of see the cultural differences and just learn about where they're from, things of that nature. And so I was able to do that twice 
And then in 2012, someone said, let's send our students over to South Africa, but it still was like a whole application process thing. And I really didn't really pay attention to it, but someone was like, well, if you don't think you're gonna get in, so like Sister Archer was like, well, you should apply. I was like, why? Wow, they like they're gonna select me. You know, I never, I didn't really take it seriously. Um, and she pretty much said, well, if you have no hope that you're gonna get in, what's the worst that can happen if you don't get it? You know, you already think you don't. So, so that didn't happen. I actually did get selected um, to serve as a delegate to go across seas. And I guess that's when everything started to hit me for it. Really didn't hit. I think until maybe we landed in London, and I was like, I am nowhere near home. It was my first time on a plane and everything, so, mm -hmm. you know, the whole time I was just like, I'm on a plane, I'm on a plane. It didn't register to me that I was going across across the country. Mm -hmm. Okay, so London first, next stop? Uh, Johannesburg, okay. and then it was South Africa. Okay. It wasn't until I got across the country, then I was like, I'm not in the United States no more. Uh-huh, okay. Oh, I think I'm going somewhere that I would have never thought in a million years, would have never bought a plane ticket to go. It's not how we grow up. This ain't one of the, our goals and our dreams is not to travel across the country and my neighborhood and, you know, so that was the very first time. Okay. So you work with the students in the Leadership for Change program mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. at Cleveland State, and then you applied mm -hmm. for Global Leadership Summit yes. and were selected. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Now you've mentioned the name of um, your church sister, Sister Archer, mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me more about her uh, so we can get her full name on the record and what role she played at Cleveland State in as far as bringing you into the program and telling you about the whole application process? Um, so she was maybe um, a coordinator, uh, executive or something of the HANA program, can't remember like her official title. So when I was applying for colleges and stuff, we did go to the same church. Um, the reality was, did I have the means to like travel to a different college, you know, to go out of state? Um, and at my high school, you have to apply for 10 colleges at minimum that mm -hmm. they will pay for. Um, and we got accepted to all of them, got scholarships to some of them, but the reality of just really getting to where you select wasn't real. So then she told me about Cleveland State and why I wasn't super hyped about still living at home to do so. It probably was the best decision ever, but that she, we got into, like I said, I was in TRIO, and TRIO and Ahana kind of was like sister programs almost. Mm -hmm. And so it was really TRIO who encouraged me to do Ahana. And then Ahana, she played a very big role there. Um, and so my years there, I served as a mentor and then like a big sister. And then that's how we got involved with the um, exchange program mm -hmm. when they came. Um, and she was the one who, when the Global Leadership Summit aspect came up, just kind of encouraged me to apply for that. Okay. Um, now you did mention earlier that um, actually getting involved in the application process, being accepted into the program, uh, be part of that delegation for the Global Leadership Summit, and then getting to mm -hmm. South Africa, that was your introduction, yes. you know, to the history mm -hmm. and culture of the South African people and all of their incredible diversity. Yes. But, um, Tell me about that moment in your life, or those weeks in your life. Um, what difference did it make as far as shaping your worldview is concerned? When I went over to South Africa? Yeah, and engaging in the workshops, you know, all of the activities. I mean, like, I feel it really gave me the energy to be more passionate about stuff that mattered. So I feel like you just every day you wake up, going to class, just trying to make A's in school. Oh, this is an issue. Like, you know, there's disparities um, between rights and stuff like that, but it, it wasn't really like a big deal because I guess like at Cleveland State, I was doing fine. It wasn't like it was hitting me, but going over there and seeing how like they still, how they still kind of affected them the way it did and being knowing that I'm a transformational leader just like these words that plays a role in what I'm supposed to do there so breaking up into a cohort meeting people around the country where like I could have did that at Cleveland State but I'm somewhere else doing that that made sense and so being around so many passionate leaders kind of just energized the conversation for me to step up speak up little things like that mm -hmm. so it was real inspirational I guess and I just needed needed to be around people doing it in order for me to start doing it. So, um, yeah, I would have to say that that really was 
the turning point was being in the midst of it. Like you can't help but to get involved in it. I mean, we had very heated conversations at one point. Um, you can see how passionate the adults were, um, just trying to teach and really, but you can see how much change the students wanted. So I was more so, we more so on the student side because we're delicates and we're meeting with students and just all of the help that they wanted and just asking, well, how come you all do this? What can we be doing better? They really just were seeking out help and assistance and it would have made no sense to spend those two weeks there and not say something, you know? Mm -hmm. So the, it was a big learning experience, but I think it really just made me feel like I have to be passionate about something because I was able to be a part of such an experience that where people were, so. Mm -hmm. And as far as your cohort is mm -hmm. concerned, what topic did you focus on? Uh, globalization. Mm -hmm. I didn't have, I'll be honest, I didn't know what that really was. Um, I, I, I got it now. What we were doing was globalization. So being able to mix these cultures like that, that's globalization. Learning about different cultures like that. Um, interacting from country to country, things of that nature. Rather mm -hmm. travel, that part's globalization. So being able to have like all of those um, intricate things come together, that was globalization. But I didn't know until I got there. Honestly, no one ever told me to learn about globalization before mm -hmm. that or that some of the things we do every single day is that. Um, so that was my core court. Mm -hmm. um, I remember doing blogs and journaling and meeting with the maybe like seven, nine people in a group. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, since you had that life changing experience in 2012, um, have you been involved in any social justice activities or anything related to uh, globalization and, or other issues that you encountered? in that cohort experience in 2012? I mean, since then, I think, um, so like with the Flint water crisis, um, I've been involved with that, rather it's donating water or even going down to Flint. So I've recently been able to go down to Flint and just really being a voice, I think is the biggest way I've been involved with like social, just talking about it. I'm always the person to bring up the conversation, have the difficult conversations, it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm okay with that. Um, I would have never been comfortable though doing that if it wasn't for that two week experience. So at this point I feel like I'm like, I'm probably not untouchable, like that's how I feel though. If I bring it up, I can't, I'm not here to offend anybody, but just to kind of put it in your ear and kind of lay it on the table and let's have this conversation. So to create those brave spaces and getting other people to have them. Um, rather it's at my job, like I think me and my me and my supervisor, we talk about race disparities all the time, um, or just some of these issues that's happening with our homeless situation, how race plays a role in that, or mm -hmm. just, um, I just had a conversation with a lady at my, so I have a part-time job too, and she was just very like enlightened by just like the information that I may or may have provided. So I think the biggest way is talking about it, Mm -hmm. and maybe putting people in the uncomfortable to get comfortable. Um, Cause I mean, I'm the friend that all my friends say you always make things a black and white issue. Mm. And it's like, it's not really an issue until you say it like that, but I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. So so race still matters in right. our society. Right. Now you, when you mentioned Flint, because I'm in the Midwest, I think Flint, Michigan. Mm -hmm. But I just want to make sure it is it's the water. Flint. Uh -huh. The water crisis here. And uh, as far as your introduction to that, I, I know we heard it, you know, all day, every day in the news, and mm -hmm. we saw the images, and it's on the internet. But um, again, what was your initial impetus for getting involved and in going to Michigan to be part of it? So that? when the, when the crisis first happened, um, everybody in the world was sending water, and you know, trying to get involved that kind of way. What people don't know is they still don't have clean water so even like recently we just went down to Flint Michigan to deliver water to them had a good conversation with um, the um, the f very first church that started the water drives there so having people come to the church to pick up water bottles that has been donated one church started it then a lot of people kind of jumped on board with that so that was the church that we delivered our water to um, and just listening in on what how it has affected the people there and how still today they are still affected and like maybe across the world we we get real hype about a situation and then it just dies down like you don't really hear much about it i mean the crisis started in 2014 and it's 2019 they still don't have clean water and a lot of the residents lost jobs moved out so i mean there have been 
you know, their half of what they were when they first started. And it's just kind of that part is just being mm -hmm. able to keep up with what's going on, how, how can we help, just mm -hmm. little things like that. We really can't do too much. I mean, water runs out. So, I mean, they, they were poisoned. So it was just kind of like that part, just learning more about that. Because the mm -hmm. first time I bought a couple of cases of water, a couple of people took them down, right? So didn't really learn much about it. But this time we was like very involved, just rather driving down there. Stuff. And I'm not, really a, I'm not really a fan of just, you know, hopping in a car and going. But that was that case this time around, so. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's through your church, St. Timothy? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and when you say the we, Yes. You know, is that the entire congregation or a certain ministry within the church? Well, so for this time when we packed water, it was for our youth day. It mm. was, um, so our theme was justice. So um, one of the projects that we do, because we do service projects every year, this one was just kind of reminded people that Flint still didn't have water. Mm -hmm. um, it was just kind of an issue that kind of got put on the back burner. Um, and so that's how I got involved with it this time around. But again, the first time it was like my pastor's thing. So he had a lot of, he communicated with a lot of different pastors and churches in Cleveland, Ohio. And we had two U-Hauls at that time that ended up taking water down mm -hmm. um, and distributing them this time. Okay, thank you. And um, now you, you've answered question number nine because I ask about the circumstances, mm -hmm. um, under what circumstances have you traveled to South Africa? 2012, right. Global Leadership Summit was your first time. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna go on to number 10, and, and that is, are you familiar with the work of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the history of post-apartheid South Africa? I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's so people who were affected by it has an opportunity to reconcile with that damage that was done to them mm -hmm. um, without no like repercussions or anything like that. That's kind of to the extent that I know it though. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, well, so the answer is yes. Uh, yeah, it was one yeah, of the okay. things that um, I know we had at least one lengthy session mm -hmm. where all of the students, uh, and there were hundreds of us there <laughs> from various countries, and all of the, the faculty and staff uh, mentors, I won't say we were guides, or, <laughs> but we were all there together listening up to that work um, and had a chance to meet Bishop Desmond Tutu, mm -hmm. you know, as he's the keynote speaker. What impression did that make on you, having him there and knowing about his work with uh, the movement itself, putting himself in harm's way, and then still being that rabble rouser for peace? I mean, that's what, make, that's what made the trip that much more re rewarding to hear from someone who started the movement themselves that's known in the books. Like you hear about Desmond Tutu and maybe we got a lot of quotes and stuff by him, but like to be in his presence is a whole nother experience. So I think that again is what made the summit so important because we could have just went down there and had workshops and stuff and learned it directly from the students or maybe the professors and stuff of the schools, but to have like this leader in front of us doing it too, that really highlighted how important this situation was that we didn't really know about till we got there. And we did, like I said, probably was in a book somewhere and I probably at that time wasn't paying attention because I was in South Africa, what does that have to do with me kind of thing? Um, but it changed my mindset and then I have him there. That's like if I was to meet, you know, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks or something like that themselves, I probably would faint and die, but like, you know, that's really what that was. Like, it was like, I can touch this person. Mm -hmm. So that was inspirational, really. Yeah. As I recall, yeah. um, the day that he addressed the gathering was Nelson Mandela Day. So that would have been July mm -hmm. of 2012. And um, I just want to ask, were you familiar with the work of Nelson Mandela before our trip to South Africa in 2012? Maybe heard about him from time mm -hmm. to time, but not too much, no. Okay, not through classes or workshops? Uh, okay. Just asking, as, <laughs> that's the historian in me. I just want to yeah. know yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if the classes are making a difference. But um, there's a, an interesting statement that Zora Neale Hurston made, and mm -hmm. uh, you probably know that I love her, right? Mm -hmm. And their eyes are watching God. Mm -hmm. But she has um, one of the characters say in the book, you gotta go there. Oh, okay. to know there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you that, know, that's it, what that was like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so it being was. there made the difference for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there anything else you would add to, there, to that about I going there and now knowing you? Like that? going, so we had a tour while we were there and we were like in the midst of where apartheid happened. And it was like, you could still feel like, it, it got real somber at that point because you could feel that like, these people are still suffering from this. Like, you know, it got really sad and it was like, I'm trying to, I want to get out of, like, I didn't want to be there long at all. Like, you know, I get it, like, but it was so sad because we still had, I remember seeing people still there, like that homeless population still there. Um, you know, the, the needy and stuff like that, people who couldn't bounce back from that. And then going with our students and all of us, because we all went on different tours, but the one I went on was an architect tour. So different landmarks was important for our tour. And we visit that area and it was just kind of very somber. So being there, I get it. Like I, I felt that, you know, mm -hmm. it, it was an energy that was just like, this is really sad. Mm -hmm. like, you know, I think we probably shed it a couple of tears and I was like, well, can we move out now? Because mm -hmm. we don't have to stay here. Well, um, but again, as a student leader then, mm -hmm. who's selected to have, you know, that immerse, immersion, you know, in those experiences and then to reflect upon them with the blogging and the journaling and, and, and to come home, mm -hmm. you know, and now you're dealing with a population that is also continuing to suffer in the wake of the successes associated with Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement mm -hmm. and Nelson Mandela and the anti-apartheid movement. Um, do you feel like you're a different kind of leader now or just more engaged now than you were then? I'm like less judgmental. Everyone's issue is my issue. Like I can't like turn my back on people because we may not be in the same situation. I think that's really what really that summit did for me is like, there are people just like me, this could be me, you know what I'm saying, that I could be helping, that I can be assisting, that I could be saying something about, that I could, like you said, join movements and stuff like that in any kind of way if I can do that. I would love to be like this revolutionary like leader and just like stand up, you know, somewhere and not get in trouble for it, but like also being willing to take risks. So that, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just had to ask that question because I heard you say, and I had that feeling too, it's your interview, but I shed a couple tears. <laughs> so, you know, and so I heard what you said about seeing so much suffering mm -hmm. and feeling so overwhelmed. For My moment was at the middle school oh, yeah. when the children were in the, I don't know if it was the yard mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, for a recess, but there were hundreds of middle school students uh, in this open space in the winter, mm -hmm. in their cute little uniforms, singing. Mm -hmm. At the school, maybe that was built for 200 students, and maybe there were about 350 mm -hmm. children there, mm -hmm. and there was no running water. Yeah. Uh, the toilets hadn't yeah. flushed in over a year. Yeah. The teachers were wearing hats and coats because there was no heat in the building. Mm -hmm. And these children That's were so singing right. in a language that I didn't understand. And I said, well, what is this song about? And, uh, and I guess the lyrics translated is, as long as God is here, mm -hmm. everything will be okay. That's when the tears <laughs> started yeah. to fall for me. But there was, it seemed to me that even in the midst of all that suffering, there was such incredible optimism. Yeah. That, that was my experience. Mm -hmm. You went on a different tour yeah. without the older people. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you sense that they were optimistic about the future? Yeah, I mean, I mean they spoke well, like, this is not where we're at today. And just like, but it's so like real, you know, for us, we just getting in the thick of it. And so we sitting here, those of us from different countries and stuff, just sitting here trying to process what this feels like. And they ha they know it, like they want to bring us here because they know what it feels like. So they're at a point of just recovery and like, they're getting over that hunch, but never to forget it and to remind us like, this is still a part of us but there is hope and we can move on. So that was like, I can't that you are like, but I'm like, I'm in this now. Like I feel like I'm here and I'm stuck and not, you know? So just, it was, I would have never, even if you told me about apartheid, that experience and feeling would have never came about unless I was there to be in it. Cause you could still see how it's still, like you said, 
affected people around. Like, you know, there were still people living outside, things of that nature. Uh, you walk through the streets, they like keep clothes, people will pickpocket you, little things like that, so scary at mm. the same time. But just being in the midst of where you know suffering happened, to see it still kind of happening in a little bit kind of way. And those that know this is the case, just telling us how they have hope and stuff like that. So you got a song and we got people just verbally telling us the story and where they at now with it and what Desmond Tutu did with it. And so that was a reminder that what part of this he played a role in and just things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So um, you've already um, answered part of question 12 because it asked about your knowledge of the work of Archbishop Desmond Tutu mm -hmm. and other Nobel laureates like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who you said you would probably faint and die. You know, have you been, been you know, in awe of the, the great things mm -hmm. that he did in the 39 years that he was on the planet. Yeah. Same with Rosa Parks, but um, I'm, I'm wondering, they were both men of God. They were religious leaders. Uh, mm -hmm. Bishop Tutu still is. He's yeah. still very much alive. Mm -hmm. But um, in that moment that you were in South Africa, in those, the moment that lasted two weeks, mm -hmm. did you get the sense that religious institutions could make a difference mm -hmm. in bringing about uh, a relief you know, mm -hmm. to the kind of suffering that you witnessed and some of the other political challenges that we were hearing about? Um, I think maybe in most of my sessions they reference God. Um, obviously, I'm one of faith. I, I strongly believe that, you know, you let go, let God kind of thing. Like, I'm all for that. Um, and so were they. So even the kids, you know, my generation, like here in the United States today, they kind of in different when it comes to picking up faith and religion, like all of these things, I'm not going to church, like things of that were very strained from that place. But there, everyone seems to be on one accord with that, that God is very so real, that faith is very so real, hope is alive. So that was inspiring too. Mm -hmm. That had We went to church while we were there, so that was a thing. Mm -hmm. um, we did go to a church. We had a discussion in one of the churches, um, like across the street from like the campus at the University of Free State. So. Was that the Kwa Kwa campus or mm -hmm. the um, Bloemfontein? Bloemfontein. Um, and then prayer, every time you ate, like little things like that. So you knew it was relevant um, to this mm -hmm. individuals. So. so now was that Bishop Tutu's Anglican kind of church or sort of an ecumenical, just a spirituality that transcended those denominational boundaries? Um, as far as the way that the students engage with religion and how they saw that as part of you know, I would say like Desmond Tutu really inspired it. Ah, okay. Um, especially being what we're doing here today. So I definitely felt like that was the case. And like like you said, a lot of the songs we heard, stuff like that, always reference like, you know, hope or something like that. So I mm -hmm. think it was definitely inspired by his movement in that. Okay. Um, now, the last few questions, and I'm mindful of the time because I know where we are in the world and I understand how parking tickets work, but the last few questions are taken verbatim from the book proposal, um, some from my chapter abstract and some from uh, the editor's proposal to the publisher. But number 14 asks, to your mind, how can a consideration of ideas that are rooted in or related to religious and or spiritual traditions enhance or hinder the development of student leadership and post-secondary learning in secular societies? So how does like religion play a role? Yeah, how can it help or hinder as far as developing more student leaders like you? Or now, uh, student alum former students, mm -hmm. alumni, who have found leadership positions in the surrounding community. How does it help or hinder? Yes. Um, well, a lot of our social issues and stuff like that, people are losing, like we said, hope, right? And so one of the things I think that religion does is tell us to have that. Mm -hmm. So anybody that has that can translate that through people. So I think that's how it helps. I, I don't, I, I think systematically and the po politics of maybe religion is what hinders um, transform. I mean, when you get to a point where you become unaccepted or um, things of that nature, I mean, we have a lot of things going on in today's society where people think that 
you know, God is against and stuff like that. So that can start to hinder depending on your message and what you're delivering and shun people away from that kind of leadership because, oh, that's a, oh, they are religious and stuff. I'm not a fan of, you know what I'm saying? Or they anti this or, you know, so that political systematic aspect of religion itself, because there's a difference between religion and spirituality. And I think when one is not connected with themselves or what they really try to be connected with, it gets much harder to deliver some type of message of hope, to be faithful in something, to be um, really putting all your energy and have like some kind of strength that goes along with like leadership. So I, it, it could play different for both. I think it could be very helpful. For me, it's been helpful. Um, one, but my experience is that's what everyone there was like too. So, mm -hmm. I mean, how easy would it be for one to be, you know, super religious and um, spiritual and try to cater to a whole bunch of people who have lost that. I mean, you're gonna keep doing it because that's what you are, but that could become such hard, harder for you as a leader. So mm -hmm. just being able to be okay with yourself um, and that. Know, your, know where you stand spiritually before we try to deliver some type of message, mm -hmm. so. Okay, well, um, would you mind sharing an example of one of those uh, hot button political issues that might hinder, you know, the work of the church if they're trying to really bring about positive change. If, if people kind of shy away from the involvement of religious institutions. I think like nowadays you see a lot with um, this disconnect with our LGBT community and our churches, right? So mm -hmm. you have a lot of churches like God said, he opens his arms to everyone. We're not judged, but then you have a lot of people who are like, gay is wrong and like you know what I'm saying but that takes away what the original message of love is because if like for me love is love so God said love everybody I mm -hmm. can't dislike you for your choices right mm -hmm. so but you see a lot of churches is different in that mm -hmm. aspect so it, it, it's hindering a great big group of people who have these identities that does not identify with what you're telling me I can't so they're disconnected with the church, they're disconnected with God, they're disconnected with spirituality, they just, and they lump in religion and spirituality together, right? Mm -hmm. And there's really nowhere where it's a hate anybody in the Bible, you know? So it is interesting how the interpretation of different things is being translated in different churches. So I could go to this Baptist church, they love everybody, and go to this Baptist church, and they dislike, they actually speak in more hate than love, so. Okay. Well, we're in the home stretch now, and I thank you certainly for sharing your thoughts on uh, LGBT issues. Um, we're in the season of Pride, the whole month I, yeah. of June, Pride Month, uh, yeah. 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion, riots, mm -hmm. uh, uprising, yeah. but an important moment mm -hmm. in our history as a nation. But um, the next question, and almost next to the last question, uh, how can institutions take global learning initiatives to scale, both in terms of the number of participating students in partner universities to influence the institution systemically. Global learning, how can we do that? I would have never, I've been in school all my life. It wasn't until I got to college where I realized you could even study abroad or you know what I'm saying, be in a different place and learn about someone else's culture and not have to do it here or read a book, right? So really making it more accessible early on in people's educational pursuit. Because at the end of the day, if I don't know about it, I can't achieve it and then make it more affordable. Make it, in some instances, that you have to do it. Like you have to, you have to actually go, right? Just kind of making it more of that. So maybe like in my grad program, maybe we should have had to study abroad at one point, mm -hmm. right? It's adult learning and development. I can't learn just only the adults here. So it was a higher ed track. So in certain instances, make it where you have to do it, a requirement, because you may be uncomfortable in the beginning, but the uncomfortability of it eventually becomes comfortable because you experience it, mm -hmm. right? So I, for me, it's make it more affordable, make it more accessible, start younger, get our kids to think about it more. A lot of kids will never know that they could have traveled the world. And for me, this was this ended up being a trip that ended up being paid for completely. I had to get my passport, and then my church helped with like spending funds and stuff like that. But the university made that affordable 
for me. That's how I got to do this trip. Otherwise, I'd still be here, like never have traveled the country. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And the last question. What is the reciprocal effect on higher education institutions collaborating on global learning initial initiatives, especially if these institutions are from different continents in the world? What do we have to gain by working with other institutions in other countries? Um, first and foremost, something like this. So the, the opportunity to create more spaces to have these difficult conversations, and then all of us gaining something. We're gonna gain knowledge from this, whether you wanna listen to it or not, whether you wanna see it or not, we're gonna gain something. But being able to open your voice, I think that's what we all, and when I'm sitting in a classroom now, in a history classroom or something like that, and I hear something, I can speak up. So just little things like that, being able to change the course of what's written. Um, so I think this is a good start. Um, there's a book being written on this. People are about to start reading it. They're going to intake. Oh, people actually experience this. You know, ain't nothing like learning from somebody who's been through it, right? So I don't go through it. You know what I'm saying? So just how to start to that's start to transform what we start to do. Like, oh, well, you know, she was there, and this is what she did, and it start to get everybody else on board. Like, if you have a, a respectable amount of people that love you and respect you and see what you're doing. They start to do little things too. It, it could be, some, it could be maybe taking an issue to Twitter or something like that. Um, having a conversation with a teacher, their projects may start to be inspired through things of this nature. So just starting to have this conversation and start to turn into something much bigger, much bigger. Get more people involved in protesting, right? Protesting, right? Um, and I can have, I have conversations all day, every day about race and then, you know, inequalities and different things like that. And it's with adults, my age group, younger kids, like it doesn't matter who you are. So that, it inspires me to keep talking about it, so. Now, um, thank you so much for answering mm -hmm. all of my questions. I really appreciate the fact that you came all the way to downtown Cleveland to meet <laughs> with us today. I put this list of questions together three weeks ago and something happened yesterday, you know? and I could not have predicted it, but I woke up and you know I reached for my cell phone, because okay. you know, I'm part of that culture too. Congress, members of Congress are having difficult dialogues with a lot of black people about another R word. It's not reconciliation, it's reparations. Mm -hmm. um, and you get the last that. word. And you, any thoughts on that? Reparations for slavery. The question, I, I mean, my only, I was listening to that today on 106.1, and he admitted that he wasn't too, like, informed either, but he doesn't understand why we let somebody else make our decisions for us. And I agree to that. But that's the thing. Why, what's, what's the issue? Why, why don't people get reparation for what has been wrong to us? And still, in the way the system is set up, it's still going to be wrong for us. Like, till this day, we still experience some type of disparity, some type of heartache, some type of, we, we gotta watch out for so much stuff because of the color of our skin. So why is this conversation so hard to be having? Why so late? So I mean, that's my ideal point. I haven't really dived in because it's kind of like, it get angry at times and you gotta kind of step back and, you know, so. Mm -hmm. I just heard that today too. I was like, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. How long will we spend on the conversation mm -hmm. versus the action? I'm all about putting action to words. After mm -hmm. I left South Africa, a couple of years later, I was thinking about it, went to a tattoo parlor and I got a tattoo that say, be the change, but it goes into like a affinity sign, so it'd be the change forever. But if you ever heard the saying um, by Gandhi, be the change you want to see. So it was kind of inspired by all of that. And it's a constant reminder. I see it every time you look at my arm, mm -hmm. a constant reminder, do something different. Yeah. Do something that's gonna change something. So mm -hmm. when I think of respiration, I'm like, I don't know. I wonder how long this, I always wonder how long the conversation is going to happen versus we do something and what's the outcome going to look like mm -hmm. and how do I get involved? Yeah. But a difficult about. conversation first. Always. I guess I'm encouraged by the fact that they finally agreed to talk about it That's always and not hard. dismiss it. So we will see Yeah. What I'm happens. interested. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. You have a good day. You too.